All right, so this one's called Deer Vaccine. Deer Vaccine. Spread your juices into the world's veins. Convince those that believe they're getting a computer chip lodged into their brains from Bill Gates that it is still better to be alive than dead and prosperous in these overwhelming times. <laughs> yes. Uh, this one's called Lorca Vision. Sorry. Uh, Federico Garcia Lorca. When I saw Lorca in a blinding light, he smiled through the bullet, though the bullet holes bled. Flamenco guitar music, slow duende dirge, singing Mi Corazon Se Llena de Agua, Un Solo Peso en el Agua, Y Dos y Uno, Tenenia La Noche Una Hendidadura, uh, Oozing Snail Steps, Hands Raised Like Goya's Third of May, Eyes closed as he Roma swayed in place. He reached down and fingered the multitudes, holes in his torso. When he began Roma stepping barefooted, feet balls side by side, heels hitting turf, shaking his head, asking, Por que? Por que? He was sucked back into the blackness of light. His hand extended towards me, not as to reach palm side up, as if El Tranquilo barked, Alto! Thank you very much. Buenas noches, familia. ¿Cómo están? Buenas noches. Gracias por acompañarnos esta noche. Bienvenidos. I am uh, Javier Villarreal. I'm going to start out with a poem called. Uh, uh, entitled yeah. Uh, yeah. El Chupa Chupacabras. Can they hear us? And it says as follows Between muertos y moribundos, nopales flourish and bear fruit. Fangs bleed in darkness. Claws harvest, beating hearts. Daydreams and nightmares forage on our hesitation. The chupacabra sniffs and laughs savoring tracks left in the air, drooling over its necks sangria treat. Ladies and gentlemen, blind balladeers bellow, deeds deemed deserving, chewing chupacabra chow. Thank you. The next one is uh, entitled Jam. <clears throat> At first sign of dawn, the uncertainty of your footsteps burdens the stillness of the day. I see you from my window, plodding along your weathered driveway, unkept mane and beard in the breeze, withdrawn in heavy footfalls, seemingly searching at every step for something missing something lost. You always believe it's Monday, a recurrence in your mind of a garbage collection day. How many times a day do you drift back and forth, pushing an empty trash bin on an endless garbage day? You drag it to an empty street over faded memories, over fallen leaves, recycling minutes from your past. Unmoved, you labor along as if shouldering a stranger's body, always on a stubborn Monday. Monday, a garbage collection day. Perhaps you thirst for a glimpse of light in the density of your days that would break the spell of time. Sometimes, in fleeting moments, I perceive a trace of clarity burning through the heavy mist in your eyes. Today is Monday, Jim. Here comes the garbage truck. You stop, stare into my eyes, and after a hesitant, how are you? Shuffle back into the shallows and disappear in the mist. Thank you, guys.
Okay, in, uh, in honor of Dia los Muertos, this is a poem uh, for Dia los Muertos entitled Dia de los Muertos. It's for um, a uh, friend of mine who passed away, Clay Blankenship. Lank hair, sweet smirk, tipped cup of secrets saluted into saucer full of smoke. Lake, night, camping in Spanish. Bajo las estrellas saudamos hasta el amanecer de Lorca y las cosas que todavía no habían pasado. The half-woven verses left to me and the sucked riptide of his passing. Intimate silk spun from Ariadne of friendship's tuition that goes on unthreading each next seam I go sealing in my crafty, sullen heart. All right, here's a poem I don't think I've ever read aloud. Seems like a safe place to do it. <laughs> this is uh, called Dream Song for Humbert Humbert, Sentimental Bicycle. Uh, and for anybody who's read Lolita, Humbert Humbert was the main, uh, the character who was pursuing Lolita in the, uh, in the book. Sore Johnny enters bar, the Gran Via entrance. Spectacular study of mute commute. Throws eyes wide open and beseeches blankly. Listen, fellow drinkers, listen, country. To the intimate bicycle wheel bespoke a fiery pit of guilt. Below the squeaking pleat of knicker, listen, summer crimes of violence to weeping sensibility. These rounded physics, jouncing calisthenics, are our greatest, grandest achievement. Achoo, salud. Johnny, 50, penitent, in good old Mexico, turning to the bar he believes in cycles, turning chance to do things over the nothing he has done, turning for tequila, for the rum, for the gaze eternally returning upon itself himself. Si, ponme una, lo de siempre. An anguish tread untreading, his words that mix with theirs, his mute, that's muted by the loud of ever dust gilt evenings. Dark planks, bartender, drinkers shout from sombrero shadows and blazing doors, sentimental returnings of glass to table, kathunk, the solid chunk of heavy bottom timpani. Then bicycle bearings, cherry forks, wheels and all unhinge the intimate. Dusk erases guilty muses, lilting one way, then another, Solid Johnny lands upon the floor. All right. Woo! Woo! Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua. Hello, I am Robin Karstensen, and I teach creative writing. I'm going to read a poem about the Karankawan, uh, the Karankawan tribe who lived on the territory between Matagorda Bay and Corpus Christi Bay for about 350 years. And the information that we have is mostly from the colonists' narratives. So I try to subvert that a little bit. And I'm uh, really excited to read this poem to you. It's called Malachite Bay. When the porch garden swings its whole body in the summer coastal breeze, you feel the evening settling in, listening to the roosters crowing, in the bluff at oddest hours, for all they are worth, for no trophy, no honor, no call return, just the sound of their own voices rattling in their skulls, echoing St. Paul the Apostle's mission bells down the long street, stoic and reverberating from the naval air base to the bamboo wind chimes on the porch, brushing each other like the cattails and canoes and caracuans slipping their oars into the Laguna Madre, paddling with the currents before the Comanche and Spaniards came. And after telling Stephen F. Austin and his bewildered stud settlers, no, we will not work for you, as the fish left everywhere and straight into their spears, their hunting senses sharp to the water's muscled curves, rippling sequined schools of fish 
flashing a glimpse of infinite over the creamy bay and dunes. Every morning, glory opening their haunted hunting forms as if they were just here yesterday, sauntering into the super Chinese buffet in this wind tidal flat wedged between the coastal plains and oil rigged towns on Corpus Christi Bay, marveling at the crystal chandelier hanging over the Kung Pao in dazzling coolness like glass clams, gathering heaps of seaweed and salmon, two elders sitting across from you, resting their long bow and arrows in the far booth facing north, dusk trickling down the window panes as they speak of their mothers and fathers dwelling in Malachite Bay, humming to their children from dawn to dusk. You are adored. You are Lamaha of our Lamaha, heart of our hearts, encoded with our blood, woven in each cell, as if they were still singing and striding the lagoons in brilliant grace, fire polished by these shores, their bodies lightning whelks of Laniakea, arcing rains of stars, the same as ours, with eyes, hands, mouths, like anemones opening for more. Thank Woo! you. All right, Zoe Ramos is here. And Zoe is going to read to us. Zoe is a, our senior editor for the Windward Review, grad student extraordinaire, very talented student. All right, would you like, do you want me to hold the mic, Zoe? Hi everyone. Uh, all right. It really is a nice night today. I wanted to read something that I know some people here have heard, but most of you haven't. And maybe maybe it's hard to hear me all the way back there, but um, this is kind of an experiment still because I tend to edit my words when I read them. And this poem, I keep adding to it and changing it anyways. Golly. Anyways, this is called The Earth is a Beautiful Place, and it's actually part found poem um, after Gwendolyn Brooks, um, the third sermon on the Warpland. The earth is a beautiful place, water mirrors and things to be reflected, golden rod across the little lagoon, and what does it take to get to that place where people love you and still know the real you, tapered and peeling off from the teeth? Life's a struggle if you want to be worth the letters in your name. Three is the number of times that I've tried to write a memoir. The materials there, like most brief periods of my life, have been a gorgeous shit show. Painful narratives and organized into compact cookies that anyone could eat the whole bag of. I'm going to share something with you that I haven't shared with anyone except my professor that I wrote this poem for. And it's that I remember taking a drawing class and halfway through I had a mental breakdown. And that's why I don't consider myself an artist. Believe it or not, I'm better at writing than speaking. I had to miss a lot of class when I was taking that art class, which is why I got a B instead of an A. And it really broke my heart that no one would ever listen to the fact that I wanted to get that A. Let's see. In Egyptian mythology, a phoenix is a bird that lived for 500 years and then consumed itself in fire, rising renewed from the ashes. Any questions? This all seems impressive, but why 500? Who or what compels a creature to destroy itself for a show? And what makes one embrace immortality but also death and is it scary and is it the good kind of scary love is mercy love is plain holy and profane love is sex but it doesn't have to be love i thought one slice of meat meeting another slice a death song for you to eat before you die the duality of soul meeting body but 
also these becoming one and you never needing to know the answer to that question. The black philosopher says love can be brutal fire, 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 smoke, fire, fire, fire. And a white philosopher says it is better to light one candle than curse the darkness. Guard here, guns loaded. As a college freshman, I wrote a paper for Intro to Philosophy, and I still remember the argument I made. All I said was, love is one of the few things in this world that we know exists for the sake of it existing. And I was quite surprised to receive an A in that class and on that paper. But my professor wrote me a note on that paper with a vehement yes, written in the margin with underlined red ink. But it was a stupid argument. I know that now, and I know that I was lazy, and I didn't want to find any citation. And I still don't know why my professor liked this argument. But I can intuit now that there is too much left for the reader to interpret. And my professor probably knew this about love already, or at least I hope. But love is love is an argument with no legs or limbs and nothing to dismember. This is an implacable logical flaw. But also love is illogical. Let's see. You're doing great. Oh, you're doing great. Yeah. Am I? Yes. Am I doing great? Yes. I think everyone is obsessed with love deep down. Everything I read is about love to me, and everything I write is about love to me. Even the painful anxiety-inducing readings that are half-baked and half-made up. I want to go ahead and thank you all for listening. Woo!